Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to be you and to present you uh, this scenario. It's going to be the first presentation in English of this scenario, which means that uh, I apologize in, in advance if some of the uh, material in the slides is still in French. I lacked time to really uh, translate everything. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, if you have questions, uh, please uh, interrupt me. Um, <clears throat> I should start by saying a few more words about uh, Negawatt. What is this uh, Negawatt organization? It is uh, uh, basically a group of experts, a think tank on energy transition issues, uh, working uh, on the French level for uh, more than 20 years now. The NGO was created in 2001. Uh, and uh, we also work on a European scenario. Uh, we've started this more recently, and I will tell you a few words about it uh, toward the end of uh, my presentation. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, development of this scenario, of course, serves for us to uh, develop policies and measures and contribute to the political debate uh, in the media with uh, parties with the uh, policy makers uh, and we've been doing this for uh, more than 20 years. The first scenario was published in 2003 and uh, the latest one uh, last October was the fifth one. Um, we've adjusted on the presidential election uh, pace for the last three scenarios trying to uh, seize the opportunity of national uh, political debates of political uh, of uh, presidential campaigns to uh, raise some issues. Um, if I start with uh, some words about the uh, context as we see it when we uh, publish this uh, new scenario, I should start by emphasizing that we are facing 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 sorry uh, uh, an increasingly uh, worrying context. Um, you might know this uh, famous quote from uh, Jacques Chirac. Uh, nous, euh, notre maison brûle et nous regardons euh, ailleurs. Our house is burning. Uh, it's never been that true, uh, that more true, uh, that it, it is literally burning as it did uh, this summer in some places, uh, in Canada, for instance. But we have not only the climate urgency, we have increasing inequalities, we have the uh, pressure on biodiversity, geopolitical uh, tensions, threats to democracy, and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, more than ever our house is burning, but more than ever we are just uh, kind of piling up uh, extinguishers that we just don't use. Uh, there, are an incre there, there is an increasing number of plans, of reports, of strategies, scenarios on, uh, on uh, the international level, like those from IPCC, uh, the IEA, on the French level, on the European level, uh, and we, we, we kind of gather more and more evidence of what uh, an ecological transition should look like, evidence that it is technically feasible, that it is rational, that it is an economic opportunity, and still we are facing uh, slow progress and even sometimes political inaction. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, we, uh, I mean we, we like to see ourselves at Negawatt uh, as you know, experts on the forefront of like, advancing and explaining, exploring uh, energy transition. And uh, we uh, think that the, really the new barrier that uh, we uh, need to overcome is uh, this political feasibility barrier in meaning how do our democratic institutions uh, cope with the kind of decentralized long-term transformation that is needed to implement um, uh, energy transition? And that is really our, uh, our uh, mindset uh, when uh, uh, introducing this uh, new scenario. We increasingly need uh, this kind of prospective approach um, that uh, provides a possible roadmap for collective action. So 
<coughs> the scenario, like the previous ones, uh, is a kind of complete scenario, meaning um, it provides a vision, a long-term vision that could be shared. Uh, it provides a pathway that could get us to that long-term vision, and it provides some means that could allow for us to take this pathway. Um, and it's always been important for us to uh, uh, kind of uh, combine these three uh, objectives through uh, our prospective analysis. This prospective analysis is a broader and more continuous one than just setting a scenario every five years. It's a, a, a real, really a ongoing process of technical analysis of what is at stake, what are the solutions, and this analysis um, I would uh, like to emphasize that it's practical, operational, in the sense that it is developed by experts that uh, most of, for, for most of their time are dealing with concrete projects of thermal retrofitting of buildings, of photovoltaic farms, and so on. Um, and it's a very much collective analysis, which uh, is also important to get a kind of balanced view of all the stakes and all the uh, uh, options. This scenario, we just put it um, in the, I mean, we kind of offer it uh, for democratic debate. Um, it's a project to be discussed. Um, and we are uh, keener than, ever, than even before to steer that debate uh, because of this democratic issue. I mean, we are very much concerned with this idea of finding a crest line uh, between the temptation to renounce because it's too difficult, because it's on a, such a broad scale and so on, or the temptation to postpone action because of possible future technological solutions. And we see more and more of those uh, kind of adverse attitudes um, and uh, Again, that is uh, our uh, reason for, uh, uh, for uh, pushing this uh, scenario. We, uh, I mean, more, more than before, uh, we uh, kind of uh, state uh, that it's not only a technical scenario. I mean, we want to be seen as experts. We are experts, but uh, we share values. We carry on values uh, like humanist values, you could say, you can, can see uh, some of the uh, keywords here. Uh, and our scenario is trying to put these values into action uh, to set the ambition of a more peaceful, a more sustainable uh, and uh, fair society, um, responding to ecological challenges, of course, but uh, also uh, seeking for uh, uh, economic, social progress, uh, seeking for improvement of flight conditions and better governance uh, patterns. And uh, uh, we've, I mean, uh, we, we really, we came to um, work uh, with, with this very uh, powerful and integrated matrix of the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, as a way to address in our methodology and in the results we are seeking, this whole set of uh, sustainable goals. Um, I think you are familiar with them, but uh, I just want to uh, uh, emphasize that the, these are not only ecological, in the sense of protecting the environment, but also social, uh, economic, and so on. And I also want to emphasize the words of the UN themselves when they uh, uh, when they, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, voted on uh, on those um, uh, on those uh, objectives, uh, that they should be seen as an integrated and indivisible matrix, um, which means that whenever you address one of the goals, you need to be careful of the impact of your action on the other uh, sustainable development goals and. Um, one of the reasons why we came to uh, 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 really, uh, I mean, to, to be really concerned with this kind of matrix or systemic analysis is that uh, it is a, uh, a study that was part of the 
IPCC report uh, on 1.5 degrees uh, pathways back in October 2018. Uh, one of the chapters dealt with the issue of synergies or trade-offs between emission uh, reduction options and other sustainable development goals. Uh, the uh, IPCC went through a complete review of uh, scientific literature on the impacts of 23, uh, the possible impacts of 23 uh, emission mitigation options on the other uh, sustainable development goals. It, it drew some scores from uh, this uh, analysis and we just uh, put those scores together in an, we aggregated the scores uh, on the whole scope of sustainable development goals. I'm not showing this to, uh, to get into uh, any detailed discussion on the respective scores of the options. It's just to show that there are huge differences um, in the possible impacts of emission reduction actions uh, when it comes to the whole set of sustainable development goals. So you should see this as the potential of an action to reduce emission to provide positive impact on the whole uh, sustainability uh, issue. And you can see that the, the central value of each of the options can uh, vary very much from uh, one option to uh, another. And you could also see that the, uh, the uh, scope of possible score depending on the conditions of implementation, uh, could also very much vary. So this is really, uh, for us, a, a strong warning that uh, although our scenario is uh, as, a, uh, as a kind of central objective to meet um, the, uh, the uh, carbon neutrality uh, uh, urgency, uh, we need to uh, be careful about the overall and systemic impact. Um, our scenario is uh, obviously, oh, one example of French that is uh, remaining, sorry. Uh, our scenario is uh, applied uh, to the uh, uh, French territory on a national basis. Um, and uh, we uh, start, of course, with the uh, energy system as it stands. So just a few words to uh, characterize it. Uh, the, uh, French energy balance is based in terms of primary energy on uh, almost 90% of uh, either fossil fuel or uh, nuclear power, meaning based on geological imported material uh, and only 11% of renewable energy. 67% um, of that primary energy is uh, conveyed to uh, final uh, to end users as final energy, uh, and you could see here the uh, share uh, between the uh, sectors. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean the uh, buildings, residential and tertiary are the first sector when it comes to energy consumption. Then, transports and then uh, the uh, industry. <coughs> we. Uh, had a long discussion within Negawatt on the uh, time scale of our scenario. We, uh, I mean, from the start, we, we, we worked with the 2050 deadline with previous scenario because, I mean, that was a very uh, obvious and uh, easy one. Um, and 2050 was, I mean, provided us, provided us with a, a, a period that was long enough to describe a complete transformation of the system. And in previous scenarios, we uh, tend to describe the uh, 2050 as a kind of landing point uh, where the transformation of the system would be complete. Uh, we still stick to this 2050 uh, deadline uh, because we think that is uh, needed uh, regarding the uh, climate urgency, for instance, and that, that is uh, the latest uh, to uh, think about, uh, I mean, to, to, that could be considered for uh, reaching carbon neutrality, for instance, but uh, we uh, increasingly uh, think of uh, longer term 
uh, we increasingly think in a long-term framework, especially uh, because of the uh, long-term climate objectives, um, which means that 2050, we, we, we no longer see 2050 as a kind of stabilized landing point, but more as a, 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 an interim point towards deeper transformation that needs to be uh, prepared for the uh, second half of the centuries, which means we've started to uh, uh, to include detailed analysis, uh, quantitative analysis for some sectors and so on beyond 2050. Uh, but still, we publish and, uh, and, and, and speak only about the analysis until 2050, especially because there are too much uncertainties uh, to cope with uh, in the longer term. This, in turn, um, provides us with the means to discuss the kind of inflection, the kind of disruptions that are needed on the shorter term, uh, that are needed by uh, 2030, uh, to get us on the right track, uh, which uh, eventually uh, helps us to uh, develop a whole set of policies and measures for the, uh, for the coming mandate. And we uh, published a whole uh, chapter of uh, our uh, uh, scenario report which deals with um, priority policies and measures uh, for, the, uh, for the next mandate. Um, <clears throat> coming back to my uh, sustainable development goals matrix, just a few words about how it, um, how it frames the way we develop the scenario, we, the, the model, the thinking uh, about the scenario, starting with uh, the uh, overall objective of reducing the environment food, environmental footprint. Um, that first uh, deals with uh, objectives or sustainable goals, sustainable development goals that uh, could be directly quantified and included in our modeling. Um, that is the case for the uh, uh, for uh, SDG uh, 13 on climate action, SDG 7 on access to uh, clean uh, and affordable energy, and SDG 12 uh, on uh, um, responsible consumption and production, which uh, mostly means reducing the uh, material footprint of the uh, economy. And our model um, is uh, based on a physical description on consumption patterns uh, going, uh, going uh, back uh, up to uh, primary resources that are used. And it's uh, centered on the energy system, describing the whole set of energy transformation uh, that is involved. But it is also uh, uh, comprehensive of the uh, raw material use of the uh, French economy, which allows for us to uh, discuss uh, some uh, trade-offs also uh, in that, uh, in that uh, area. And uh, I mean, we have a, a complete assessment of greenhouse gas emissions as well, uh, not only in terms of domestic energy use, domestic material use, domestic emissions, but also in terms of footprint uh, of the uh, economy. Um, we <coughs> also include other uh, uh, environmental uh, goals, um, such as uh, 14 and 15 about uh, protecting uh, biodiversity, or six about clean uh, water. Uh, this could not be quantified on a national basis through our scenario, but our scenario allows for us to think about uh, I mean, the qualitative effects on those objectives of the quantifications that we develop. Then, of course, we think of new economic dynamics, um, the uh, <coughs> creation of jobs, the uh, um, resilience, the uh, uh, sustainability of uh, industry and uh, infrastructures, the uh, need to develop uh, uh, sustainable cities and communities. Um, when it comes to uh, innovation, and I'm sorry, I could really not translate this one because it's a, I mean, this is an image and not a, a table. Um, uh, still, I could have translated the text, but um, I mean, this is about our 
kind of cautious approach towards innovation. Um, we uh, consider that there will be, of course, innovation uh, by 2050, but uh, if it's not already mature enough, a technology or an innovation has no, I mean, could, could really not be deployed on the kind of scale that is needed before 2050, which means that we uh, are cautious about the uh, technological readiness level and the manufacturing readiness level of uh, innovations. And we only take into account options that are high enough on those two uh, international standardized scales. Um, but we also include this uh, other scale on the right, which is a, a, a scale of environmental and societal readiness, which is uh, trying to capture uh, the, uh, I mean, how much of the environmental and uh, social impact of a technology, of an innovation have been characterized, assessed, and how their acceptability uh, in, in a, a deep sense uh, could be uh, assessed as well. Another important uh, implication of this, uh, of, of taking into account those economic sustainable development goals is uh, to uh, look kind of beyond the uh, national level um, to uh, what happens in territories. I mean, this, I mean, our model doesn't go into a kind of description of regions or even smaller territories, but we uh, are concerned when thinking about the uh, uh, assumptions about what they mean for local development, for local dynamics, for the uh, real uh, economic, um, uh, economic uh, fabric uh, on the ground and for uh, uh, developing uh, robust and resilient strategies on a uh, local level. We also consider, of course, social uh, progress related objectives uh, <coughs> uh, about poverty, about hunger, about uh, inequalities, and this um, is very much uh, uh, linked to uh, uh, some uh, thoughts we develop about uh, sufficiency. I will show you uh, uh, in, a, in a moment what we mean by sufficiency and uh, how we uh, try to uh, work with it. But um, I mean, sufficiency uh, comes as a way to uh, set the right level of services that are delivered to people and uh, is very much related to equity or solidarity issues. Um, we uh, think, I, I, I don't know if you, if you know the uh, donut economy theory by uh, Kate Reworth, but uh, I mean it's uh, summarized here. Um, and the, uh, uh, it, it's been adapted to uh, energy services on the right. The idea is really to uh, set the uh, overall uh, pathway uh, towards uh, 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 an objective that is within those two boundaries of uh, consuming patterns that are, uh, that are uh, compatible with planetary boundaries, uh, but uh, consuming patterns that deliver like decent, decent lifestyle for uh, everyone. Uh, <coughs> we also include, uh, I mean, uh, improvements regarding uh, conditions of living, and that, for instance, relates to uh, uh, SDG 3 on uh, health and uh, well-being. And finally, uh, we uh, take into account more governance-related uh, objectives. Um, 16 and 17, to start with, that deal with uh, peace, better uh, and stronger uh, institutions, and also cooperation towards the achievements of the uh, SDGs, um, which uh, brings us to uh, consider parallel to, uh, the, uh, to what happens within the French territory, what happens outside, and uh, set our national scenario in a framework that, that 
bears some concern for uh, cooperation, for solidarity, for uh, fair access to uh, resources on a, on a worldwide level. Um, and uh, <coughs> the uh, only SDG I didn't uh, comment on yet is the SDG 4 about the quality of education. I mean, there's not much link between uh, an energy scenario in France and education issue. I mean, that might be m more, uh, a more acute issue in, uh, in uh, other countries uh, in the South. Still, we take this goal as a reminder that energy transition, as we describe it, especially in the face of political feasibility, uh, could only happen through more participatory, participatory processes, more uh, horizontal democracy, uh, which calls for information, education, and participation on, uh, of the people to uh, a debate and to uh, elaborating these uh, strategies. Um, <coughs> I will now say a few words about the, uh, uh, the uh, Negawatt approach, um, and that will bring me to uh, this uh, issue of uh, sufficiency, which is core uh, to our work. Um, this is just to explain the way we uh, see uh, the uh, energy issue from uh, ba using a very uh, basic example of uh, what we call an energy chain. I mean, the uh, relation between an energy resource and the uh, use that we make of it. Uh, this energy change starts with uh, oil. We need to refine it. We need to transform it into electricity if, like in uh, this case, we want to get light uh, at the end of the chain. Electricity needs to be uh, delivered to the final consumer. That is what is called final energy, in contrast with the primary energy, that is the uh, oil itself. Um, but still, uh, you're not consuming electricity. I mean, you are, you are buying electricity, but what you are consuming in that case is light. So you need something that will convert electricity in light, a light bulb, with a very strong uh, efficiency uh, issue, of course. I mean, the uh, old light bulbs like this one are just uh, wasting 95% of the electricity into heat and only 5% uh, uh, is provided as light. So a very important uh, issue with the quality of conversion, but still it's not the end of the chain. Uh, you can see here this uh, uh, very uh, nice uh, uh, lamps, we call it lampadaire boule uh, in French. Uh, very nice, but very silly. They uh, send most of the light uh, up to the sky to get light uh, on the floor, uh, which means a waste of light and therefore a waste of energy and therefore a waste of resource. And this is still not the end of the story. If you get, as on the far right, uh, 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 a lamp with a, uh, an efficient light bulb, uh, with a reflector to send the light uh, to the floor, but which is uh, lead, which is just uh, using electricity at a time when the light is obviously not needed, then again you're wasting uh, energy and resources. Uh, all this to say that, I mean, we change the perspective uh, of uh, look uh, we uh, put on the energy system. It is traditionally said this way, starting with a resource down to uh, the final use. We start with the energy service and we start with thinking about being more clever on why and how we are using energy services. Uh, and this uh, cleverness, individual and collective, about energy services is what we call sufficiency. Coming before efficiency, which is uh, in a more traditional way the uh, uh, improvement of, uh, of uh, technical rates all along the chain to reduce losses. There are losses uh, in uh, each uh, step. And the way we put it is that sufficiency and efficiency are needed to 
control as much as we can the quantity of energy resources that we need because that is key to substitute between energy resources instead of adding and piling up. Um, <coughs> oh, I thought I had masked this one. It's in French, it's just the, the same but uh, with some text. Um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, sufficiency is uh, something that is more difficult to uh, quantify and characterize than uh, efficiency or substitution, uh, but still uh, one can develop some uh, uh, rationale about uh, energy services and uh, their uh, hierarchy, priorities, I mean, you, I mean you, 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 anyone could do that exercise on an individual level, thinking of the uh, energy services you are using, eating your house, uh, uh, your mobility, uh, the appliances you are using and so on. Um, some of these uses are really vital, some are not necessary, some are even unacceptable if you consider their impact uh, <coughs> In, in, and, and in relation to uh, their uh, benefit. You could, once you have developed such a hierarchy on an individual or collective level, I mean, you could start thinking of regulations, incitatives, uh, dissuasive policies, uh, to make sure that the more vital or needed uh, uses of energy are fulfilled while the more uh, unnecessary or unacceptable are uh, phased out. Um, we, <coughs> I mean, thinking about sufficiency in a more uh, operational way leads us to think of different stages or different categories of sufficiency that could be addressed. Um, the first one is the servicial sufficiency. It's, it deals with the intensity or the duration of use of, of uh, equipment. Uh, that is, for instance, very obvious things like turning off appliances. That also calls for re I mean, um, reducing the uh, planned obsolescence of some, uh, of some goods. Um, uh, you could also include uh, reducing uh, speed limit in that category, for instance. It is a category that might call for regulations or for collective action, but that is the easiest to grasp from an end-use consumer perspective. Uh, it's more complex if you think of the second one, which is dimensional sufficiency, which is about the uh, size or the nominal capacity of equipment. So when, it, when this is about appliances, still you could make some choice as an individual consumer, but you will depend on what is uh, uh, offered in, uh, in, in shops. But when it, ca when it comes to buildings, floor areas, to vehicles and the size of the vehicles, then it's more complex, of course, to, uh, uh, to uh, deal with, the, uh, with, with individual choices. And still, the uh, evolution of floor areas, uh, whether it's about the uh, energy consumption or land use, or material used for uh, construction is a key issue and shifting from the current uh, relationship we have with cars where uh, most of the cars are uh, not used most of the time and the uh, cars are uh, uh, designed to uh, take f like five people on motorways and used most of the time alone in cities um, and we get those big SUVs and so on. So we need to shift on such uh, very uh, framing issues and you can see that it's not possible only on an in individual level. Um, <coughs> the third uh, stage of sufficiency, uh, we call it organizational. Um, it deals with sharing or organizing to uh, reduce the need for energy services. Uh, it could be car sharing, it could be uh, co-working spaces. Uh, it also uh, deals with urban planning, like I mean, the uh, idea of gradually reducing distances we need to cover to get this to the same services. Um, 
I mean, at, at, at the time of the uh, Yellow Jersey crisis, when he first responded to it, uh, President Macron started his speech by saying, we are just the victims of 40 years of, uh, of uh, development where distances to be covered by people have just increased without control. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we increase the dependency on car to cover increasing distances and we need uh, to uh, reduce this. This is just to emphasize how collective and long-term action is needed to implement that kind of sufficiency. Uh, all this to say that um, contrary to uh, most of uh, the discussion on uh, sufficiency options, which comes as like lifestyle or behavior, uh, behavior changes and which puts a lot of emphasis on the uh, consumer side of uh, and the consumer's responsibility for change uh, and more uh, sustainable consuming patterns. We emphasize the need for a kind of supply for sufficiency, the need for uh, public policies to create the infrastructures and to regulate business models so that sufficiency options are offered to, uh, uh, to people and that these sufficiency options are kind of uh, attractive enough to overcome incumbent, uh, incumbent models. Um, we include in our uh, modeling and in, in our scenario some uh, <coughs> sufficiency uh, uh, on food and goods, uh, not only about uh, energy uh, related uh, uh, items. This is for reasons of reducing carbon footprint and for instance for food that means halving the uh, share of meat in uh, the uh, average diet by 2050. Uh, and regarding the goods, it's meant to reduce the uh, material footprint. Um, I will go faster with efficiency stages. Uh, it's maybe uh, uh, better known and uh, maybe less specific to uh, the, the work of Negawatt. Uh, but uh, starting uh, nevertheless to, uh, with this, uh, the, the importance of what we call gray energy, which is not the energy used for heating buildings or uh, used by vehicles or uh, appliances, but the energy that is used to build them or manufacture them. Uh, this <coughs> goes with better uh, uh, construction and uh, manufacturing practices with uh, optimizing uh, life, si life cycle uh, uh, energy or materials uh, and for instance shifting uh, steel and concrete uh, based uh, buildings uh, to a new uh, wood based uh, wood structured buildings. Um, <coughs> after grey energy we have to address the uh, useful energy that is the uh, performance of uh, delivering you the uh, Eat or the light uh, that you need, and that uh, especially, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the main concern in that area is the uh, thermal quality of buildings, and it is really uh, uh, something that most scenarios and most experts share that we can't meet climate and sustainability objectives if we don't succeed in a deep retrofitting, thermal retrofitting. Uh, program of the uh, existing buildings, which are already most of the buildings of 2050. Um, <coughs> we uh, also address uh, efficiency on the uh, final energy stage. That means uh, the uh, efficiency of uh, converters, energy converters, light bulbs, uh, for instance, but uh, all appliances, all vehicles, motors, all processes in the uh, industry, and Finally, uh, there's also room for uh, improvements on the primary energy level. That uh, means, uh, for instance, uh, uh, better efficiency uh, of production. For instance, developing uh, what is called combined heat and power when you generate electricity through 
a process that heats uh, water to use the wasted heat for a uh, urban uh, heating uh, system or an industrial process uh, or recovering uh, energy, uh, primary energy, uh, anywhere it's lost. The third stage of the uh, approach is substitution um, and our uh, vision in, in terms of deep sustainability of uh, substitution is not only carbon centered, so it's not as uh, some uh, and, and many players in the debate, uh, we, we, we don't set the difference between uh, carbon or fossil fuels on one end and low carbon energies on the other end. The uh, main difference we make is between stock-based energies that just exhaust uh, an existing stock, geological stock, and that includes, of course, fossil fuels, but also nuclear power. And on the other hand, uh, flow-based energy that are uh, renewables um, and uh, <coughs> We uh, think they are intrinsically more sustainable and uh, this uh, little uh, schematic representation illustrates how it is not a matter of availability of flow-based uh, energy. We have plenty of it. Uh, one hour of sun provides enough for one year of uh, energy consumption. Uh, it's not a matter of availability, it's a matter of our capacity to use it, to use this kind of diffuse energy, to capture it and use it in a, in a, in a, in a way that is as efficient as when we waste energy that has been stocked through uh, geological times. Um, some of the uh, main uh, 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 orientations of, uh, of the scenario Going back to some of the uh, items I've mentioned in the uh, sufficiency and uh, efficiency uh, uh, areas, the starting with buildings. Sufficiency mean, means, first of all, uh, addressing the uh, issue of stabilizing the floor areas uh, through uh, assumptions, for instance, on uh, stabilizing the uh, cohabitation ratio, which is the average number of people per dwelling. Not, uh, which does not mean we uh, want to uh, intervene in the life of families, of course, but uh, to uh, incitate to, uh, uh, um, to uh, uh, flat sharing by uh, students or uh, to uh, renting uh, rooms in, uh, uh, in family houses where there's only a, a retired person. Um, reduction of new builds. Uh, reasonable dimensioning of uh, all the uh, equipment and uh, appliances, better efficiency of the appliances, better efficiency of the uh, buildings, uh, again uh, emphasizing the issue of uh, much deeper uh, progress in uh, retrofitting programs as illustrated on the red dotted line that the current uh, plan implemented by the French government, that is the blue line, uh, and uh, substituting heat systems, uh, going for uh, efficient heat pumps or wood systems, which are the most efficient uh, that uh, we uh, have uh, at uh, our uh, disposal. <coughs> for transport, um, sufficiency means, of course, model shift. Uh, from car to train, from uh, car to uh, soft modes uh, for uh, short distances. As I said, uh, urban planning on the longer term allows for reducing by 15% the distance traveled uh, on average. Um, uh, planning, but also changes in the uh, consumption of goods allows for reducing by 20% the overall tons, kilometers of uh, freight. We uh, include some efficiency, uh, of course, of vehicles, uh, especially with changes um, in uh, more uh, car sharing, car pulling modes that allow, for instance, to have uh, up to 40% of the cars that become micro cars used only on, uh, in uh, urban uh, 
dense uh, urban areas. And uh, regarding substitution, as oil dependency of transport is, uh, of course, a key issue for uh, decarbonizing, uh, we shift to electric vehicles, but with uh, some uh, limitations. I mean, we don't, uh, we don't develop a full electric uh, vehicle fleet in the scenario, mostly for uh, reasons relating to lithium uh, and resources in general. I mean, shifting to electricity means that we need to increase a lot the use of materials for batteries. In our scenario, that's a ninefold increase for lithium. Um, and although we use, we have strong assumptions on the uh, performance of batteries. Yeah? Sorry, when you say in your scenario, do you mean even if you assume that we don't have to switch to electric cars? Yeah, so that, that is, that is that these are figures based on the trajectory of the Negawatt uh, scenario. So uh, we have 70% full electric cars, 30% hybrids, uh, and about 10% of, uh, uh, of uh, trucks. I mean, now only light trucks in, uh, in, uh, in cities are electric. Uh, we don't think that is, uh, that is relevant to uh, go for uh, heavy uh, electric trucks. But even, even with those low assumptions and all the sufficiency assumptions we include on the number of cars that decreases by 40 percent, for instance, in, in, in new cars every year by 2050, even with that and strong assumptions on the performance of batteries and the uh, recycling of lithium, which is uh, a very uh, difficult technical uh, issue, um, you can see here that the overall Cumulated consumption of lithium in our uh, scenario, in blue, is coming close by 2050 uh, and the uh, following years to the uh, red line, which represents the French uh, share in terms of population of proven resources as we know them today. Um, which means that going over that red line would call for more extraction of lithium and or uh, unfair share of the resource between uh, populations and uh, at least to, could lead to something that is not sustainable as a lifestyle on a worldwide level. Um, so in other words, we need the kind of strong sufficiency assumptions that we have introduced if, he, if we want to avoid to shift from, uh, from a, a scarcity of uh, oil to a scarcity of lithium. In the industry, uh, we introduce sufficiency assumptions regarding the consumption of goods, regarding the implementation of circular economy, regarding what we call virtuous uh, reindustrialization, meaning that it's not uh, relocating uh, industry, uh, any, uh, any kind of industry, but focusing on those uh, where, uh, for which it's meaningful, either in terms of their uh, strategic uh, role for the uh, energy transition or because it's those that reduce the most the carbon footprint or those where France could uh, hope to uh, be uh, competitive. Um, we include some uh, efficiency, uh, of course, some uh, electrification of processes, development of um, hydrogen also. And uh, this uh, is uh, piling up to uh, uh, an overall reduction uh, of uh, consumption. I will give you the figure in, uh, in a minute. We, uh, <coughs> we uh, foresee a strong development of renewables, of course. Um, it's uh, well, <coughs> we, we, we might discuss it uh, further uh, um, after my presentation, but the, the, the main point is that it's not only about developing electric renewables, it's also about developing the use of biomass, especially solid biomass and uh, biogas. And when it comes to renewables, we uh, uh, are uh, kind of cautious about the, uh, the uh, numbers. Uh, for instance, we uh, get to uh, 18,000 
uh, wind, um, wind turbines uh, on the French territory, so uh, onshore, uh, onshore uh, wind turbines, uh, compared to 27,000 or even 30,000 that are already uh, in place in Germany. Solid biomass is, well, mostly uh, wood, okay. Uh, but the, the, the main point is that uh, we, uh, I mean, we, we, we develop solid biomass and biogas, but not biofuels because of the uh, overall uh, impact of biofuel and the, uh, uh, and, uh, the uh, land, use, uh, land use issues. Uh, this development of renewables comes, of course, with the uh, phasing out of uh, fossil fuel that is quite fast. You can see uh, on the left the uh, impact in the uh, first decade, um, and that is almost complete. Um, at the end of the scenario, we uh, have completely phased out fossil fuels, apart from uh, a very uh, small quantity that is still used for non-energetic uses. I mean, as, as, a, as a raw material for, uh, for uh, material industry. Um, coming now to uh, nuclear power, we, uh, uh, yeah, we <coughs> state that existing or new nuclear is intrinsically less sustainable than electric renewables, and that was shown in the uh, uh, IPCC graph, uh, IPCC-based graph that I uh, introduced earlier. Uh, we have increasing evidence, I mean, Negawatt was pioneer in uh, assessing it, but uh, we have increasing evidence even by uh, official uh, uh, institutes or uh, organizations that 100% uh, electric system is feasible by 2050. And we see every day that the uh, economic uh, competitiveness, uh, the uh, readiness, the scalability of renewables is uh, uh, much larger than, one, than that of, uh, of uh, nuclear power, just a figure. Worldwide, in 2020, uh, renewables added 20, uh, sorry, 256 gigawatts of capacity. Nuclear added 0.4 gigawatt of capacity. So it's just not the same, uh, not the same uh, world. Um, uh, that leads us to, uh, uh, to uh, exclude any new reactor or new facility in the scenario and to uh, search for a kind of progressive shutdown of reactors. Uh, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot of complexity. Yeah, there's a lot of complexity uh, beyond this, but uh, progressive shutdown, um, which uh, <coughs> goes with uh, some need for flexibility in the way uh, this uh, trajectory could be uh, controlled, but which also calls for a responsible approach and that these are issues that are mostly missing in the French debate, especially uh, on, on the side of those players that call for uh, new uh, reactors or extending the lifetime of uh, existing reactors. I mean, we need to uh, be consistent between the phase out of reactors and the phase out of the other nuclear plants. Uh, consistent with the uh, overall uh, inventory at the end of uh, materials and waste accumulated and consistent with the social impact, meaning dealing with the, uh, with the uh, reactor's closure uh, impact on the site and trying to, you know, um, to, uh, to, 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 to phase out progressively the reactors on one site. Uh, exactly the opposite that what was done with Fessenheim when they shut down uh, the two reactors at the, at the same time, which created a lot of uh, problems. Main results, in terms of final energy consumptions, we are down by 50%. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, dynamics depend on, the, on, on sectors, but uh, altogether uh, it's uh, roughly 50% reduction. Uh, this allows for shifting to renewables and meeting 100% renewable supply, local renewable supply for primary uh, energy by, uh, uh, by 2050. Um, I'm not commenting this, but you 
we'll see if you want in this uh, graph uh, the uh, detail of the uh, energy and electric mix by um, 2050. Um, I, another uh, important uh, result of the scenario is the uh, overall reduction of the raw materials footprint. Uh, you can see here, uh, like uh, <coughs> it, uh, it, it is reduced for all major uh, materials, and uh, even for uh, for uh, metallic materials, uh, there is a decrease, uh, and in some cases, very strong decrease. Uh, for uh, most of them, but uh, a warning uh, on some of them, and especially as you see on uh, lithium, as I already uh, mentioned. Um, we, uh, I mean, the scenario reaches carbon neutrality not only in terms of domestic emissions, but also in terms of uh, carbon footprint uh, by 2050, uh, by strongly, uh, well, almost phasing out uh, carbon. Uh, carbon emissions in the energy system, halving the other uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and reducing the overall uh, footprint uh, for uh, non-domestic uh, non uh, emissions. Uh, <coughs> there are uh, also uh, some qualitative positive impacts of the scenario on uh, protecting biodiversity, on water quality, on health, for instance, we uh, uh, calculated that the, uh, the shift to cycling uh, could save about 10,000 uh, premature deaths by 2050. Um, a better comfort of life through uh, different uh, items. And uh, in terms of uh, development, uh, households are less exposed to uh, energy prices. So the scenario is reducing energy uh, poverty and uh, energy vul vulnerability. It is a scenario that creates uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, altogether. Al al also, of course, it, it, it destroys jobs in some sectors and uh, we are very cautious and very uh, keen on uh, developing policies for uh, reconversion and uh, reindustrialization. Um, and uh, the scenario comes with better and fairer uh, cooperation and governance practices on um, every uh, level. Just, I'm done with time, but maybe a very few words about the uh, European development we are, uh, uh, um, we, we are stuck with, I would say. Uh, we, uh, did we, we started uh, a couple of years ago a kind of ambitious uh, project to develop a European scenario uh, with the same approach as the French one uh, because we think that this kind of uh, bottom-up uh, approach and sufficiency-based reasoning is missing on the uh, European level. Uh, we want to do it by developing uh, a scenario that is based on national contexts and trajectories that are meaningful in the national context, not something like we that we develop on the European level and then uh, look uh, in, in a kind of top-down way. We've built a network to do that with uh, partners in uh, more than uh, in, in, in 20 European countries now, uh, which are partners of very uh, different nature, which is both uh, very uh, interesting and fruitful for the project, but very challenging, of course. Um, and yeah, we are we are in that process of uh, developing uh, based on their starting point uh, uh, in terms of national national uh, plans, national scenarios, to uh, develop uh, to harmonize and reinforce those national strategies, trying to aggregate them as a European trajectory, and then further develop it based on. Uh, sharing potentials, sharing constraints on the European level to get to that uh, European vision. So we are just in that process and I just uh, want to emphasize the kind of issues that uh, we come to when we discuss this. Um, this is um, a figure on the, about the uh, square meters per person uh, or the uh, uh, kilometers covered per person. 
uh, in grey as a starting point, in blue as uh, an end point in the uh, national trajectories as they standed uh, when, we, when we started. And you can see that there are strong discrepancies between the countries. Um, and for instance, I told you earlier that we are just, uh, or I forgot maybe to say, no, we stabilize the floor area square meters per person uh, in our French scenario. Uh, around 45, 46 square meters per person. When you talk to uh, people in, uh, say, uh, Romania, where they start with uh, just uh, above 20, I mean, you can't tell them that, we, that they should stabilize too. So you need to allow for them to increase this indicator, which calls for us to think about reducing and not only stabilizing, maybe, um, on, um, on, in, on the French level. This is what led us to thinking in terms of sufficiency corridors where uh, lifestyles in the different countries could uh, converge, which uh, again uh, illustrates the link between this sufficiency reasoning and uh, inequalities or uh, solidarity uh, issues. And yeah, I'm stopping here. I've been a bit longer than uh, I should, but uh, thank you for your attention. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, we would like to thank you for this amazing presentation. It was very insightful. Thank you. For, uh, it was very insightful and uh, important. And now me and Peter are going to give um, our small comments and uh, of things we wanted to highlight and questions we wanted to raise. Um, I'm going to talk about the case of France, uh, uh, given, like, diving deeper into the policy recommendations of Negawatt, uh, and Peter is contrasting it with Germany and goes to the EU level. So, um, both 2017 and uh, the recently published uh, Negawatt scenarios, they applied the Negawatt approach to the energy system and the uh, um, transition in the view of Negawatt uh, consists of three components, as we already know, sufficiency, efficiency, and uh, renewables. And um, the Negawatt scenario doesn't just state this, uh, they also uh, fully in line with the objective of um, concrete feasibility. They provide uh, proposals and recommendations, as it was already mentioned, measures that are necessary, and um, even though it, it is far from being exhaustive, uh, it does a good job talking about the, the markets that uh, need to emerge uh, within this five-year program, for example. And uh, if we take into account the energy consumption side, um, there are some policy recommendations that we would like to highlight. Like, for example, the taxa taxation that goes beyond carbon uh, mm, to finance the energy transition, because we already understand that taxing carbon uh, is essential, uh, like putting a price on carbon is essential because it would uh, shift the consumer preference and um, it will create a substantial fund for, um, for being used to the future energy transition. But Negawatt states that uh, putting a price on carbon as like the one and only source, um, uh, only component of this tax is not enough and is not consistent with the objectives. So we also need to take into account the consumption of primary energy and the like environmental externality, externalities that are brought by transformation, transport and like consumption of this energy, like for example emissions and stuff. And uh, the revenue generated by this tax will be um, um, divided uh, by three uh, distinct and complementary um, um, objectives. The first one would be the compensation for low-income um, households that uh, don't have the access to this uh, alternatives. The second one would be to local authorities to finance the local energy transition. And the third one is um, the construction of a national fund uh, that uh, would finance the energy transition. And what it gives us, it gives us a transparent, um, efficient and socially just uh, system. And only by, like, uh, at a cost of system like this, uh, the energy transition can be supported and then like it can be uh, perceived as uh, an opportunity. 
And the second policy recommendation we wanted to highlight is uh, concerned with um, mobility measures uh, to make them uh, more accessible and less reliant on fossils. And apart from uh, reinforcing the cycling plans, uh, reinf uh, reinforcing the uh, cycling plans and recovery uh, of uh, a railway system. Uh, Negawatt also mentioned a reform of uh, automotive taxation uh, to support the development of um, uh, electric, electric mobility that is accessible and respectful for the environment and also that is uh, taking into account the consumption of uh, resources as was mentioned. And um, they already talked about, uh, talk about putting an end to um, the tax exemption of uh, air uh, sector in France. And um, there is also a point that the, uh, the sale of diesel and gasoline vehicles by 2035 uh, um, will end and in favor of uh, hybrid and electric vehicles. And as we can see in uh, the figures provided in 2017 report uh, by Negawatt, uh, we can see that um, the, uh, the future um, the future plans are achieved by reducing the consumption, like the policies that we talked about, they are focused on the energy consumption side. So, um, the, um, uh, and uh, it's not the only side that the negative scenarios are concerned with, they're also concerned with the negative uh, energy supply side. And um, the, apart from, mm, Apart from uh, focusing on renewables, we also can see that the, the purple over here is a nuclear energy that is going to be, um, there is no, like, uh, no reliance on nuclear energy that now France is hugely reliant on. And uh, by 2035, uh, Negawatt scenario promises that the last nuclear reactor will be closed. So, and no new reactors are planning to be built, which uh, totally makes sense is uh, like the dependence of on the nuclear by France uh, also increases uh, like the the dependence on a supply of the uh, uranium uh, and uh, the point that we wanted to highlight that there is no um, there is complete absence of nuclear waste management and according for example to the nuclear waste report of 2019 we can see that uh, Eu European um, Nuclear uh, reactors, they may produce the amount of nuclear waste that if we're going to stack it all together, it's going to be higher than the highest building that we have on Earth, uh, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And France is one of the countries con accounting for the majority of this uh, waste. And according to the same report, we can say that now uh, there is no country in the world that has a, um, a, r a deep geological repository for nuclear waste, uh, except, except for Finland, that is now currently in the construction of one. And decommission, uh, although it is important, as we can say, uh, it also creates waste as um, once nuclear uh, power plant is closed, uh, there has to be fuel that needs to be removed, like the cooling systems and etc. So that raises again the importance of um, appropriate measures to be uh, put in place. Um, f and um, apart from the nuclear power, we can see a huge reliance, like the, the blue line over here, the huge reliance on biomass that was already, um, bioenergy and biomass that was already mentioned. And uh, we can see that by 2050, the uh, reliance on coal, gas and um, uh, Oil has disappeared, but we have uh, a huge reliance on biomass and bioenergy. And uh, we can say that uh, biomass is a huge part of, is an essential resource for the circular economy because um, instead of getting rid of, for example, I know, wood pellets, we can do something useful out of it. And instead of creating something out of fossil fuels, we can use biomass to do that. However, uh, burning biomass for energy is really wasteful. And um, it is responsible of rising like huge level of carbon dioxide and uh, a lot of environmental destruction. Like for example, the um, land use can uh, contribute to more um, um, loss of uh, carbon sinks and also the um, loss of biodiversity. Apart from that, uh, 
burning, for example, wood pellets uh, contributes to very harmful uh, particles being released and uh, that uh, leads to health hazards for communities that are living near those um, plants and uh, this cause, uh, causes the same problems as uh, living near a cold plant, so like asthma, lung problems and etc. Uh, it may also lead to violation of human rights uh, of local communities who depend on this um, land, as there is like land grabbing, uh, exploitation, uh, etc. Especially if we, if we take into account um, communities of the global south and like importing the bioenergy. And for us, it was particularly intriguing uh, how bioenergy, considering all of that, uh, is presented as a like a huge part of the plan. And um, uh, here we wanted to highlight that bioenergy uh, operates using the same, um, the same extractive ideology in a sense, because the, the same ideology that got us here in the first place, um, because um, there is, uh, it relies on resource exploitation, taking into account only short-term gains instead of like talking about human rights. Uh, communities, ecosystems, and the question would be like, is it a real change? And um, now I would like to give the word to Peter to contrast it with the case of Germany. Thank you. So first of all, thank you also for me very much for, for your presentation and also for obviously for all your work on, on the Negawatt scenario and also the nuclear waste report. Um, so I'm, I'm now going to be focusing on Germany, which has also seen a recent proliferation of different climate reports. I was myself involved in the writing the climate action plan for Germany with German Zero, and there's other ones like uh, that, and loads from the German Environmental Protection Agency, Wuppertal Institute, which I believe you are aiming to be working with, who have also written a report for Fridays for Future. Um, and I find it interesting contrasting them, because of course Germany is a somewhat different scenario. So you've currently got an aim in Germany for minus 65% of emissions by 2030 and net zero already in 2045. And this was already the previous government which was aiming for this. The same, the new government is still aiming for that. Um, while that is seems to be more, it's still definitely insufficient. As you can see, this down here is from 2020, the remaining carbon budget, which is basically, although COVID gave us a tiny bit longer, going to run out in the next two years or so for a two-thirds chance of staying below 1.5 degree, the population base chair. Um, what's interesting also is that a lot of the NGOs in Germany, and especially Fridays for Future, are really calling for 2035 as the last end date when you see that like this is the <laughs> what we've got in terms of our fair share we still wouldn't be ab above our fair share, but can we really go to 2050 with all that? Um, now, just quickly, I'll try to go quick because we don't have that much time. Um, talk about renewable energy. So in Germany, the, the government is now aiming to add uh, 20 gigawatts of solar energy and 15 gigawatts of wind energy capacity every year in the late 2020s, which of course contrasts with what we just heard, which is by 2030, well, only 47 gigawatts of photovoltaic, which would be two and a half years of German addition, not what there is now, and only 45 um, gigawatts of wind energy. Considering that France has a lot more coasts, so a lot more potential for wind energy, this is also quite interesting. Looking at biomass and energy, a lot of the German focus is to, to really get biomass out of the energy mix, because it's currently using 13% of Germany's land area, is used for energy plants, which is quite a high amount. So, for instance, the German Environmental Agency is arguing that this practice should be ended by 2030. Uh, and so the energy that is currently used, which is 270 terawatt hours of biomass, should be reduced to what an arg NGO uh, is arguing to around 150 terawatt hours, because of the reasons we also heard earlier. Um, and from this, two-thirds should really be going to industry, as we heard earlier as well, as a resource, and the rest be used for when we have low renewable energy, because no wind, no solar, 
and so on. Um, yeah, and just just very quickly, uh, sorry, just very quickly. I mean, I find it interesting with with France is currently at a hidden at 50 where Germany is aiming towards over the long term, at least according to to a lot of the NGOs. And I wonder how it would be possible to increase this while trying to do like wetland restoration, uh, reforestation, etc. Um, now we're going to move on to the European Union just quickly. We probably have all heard of the Green Deal and also of the Fit for 55 program, which has meant that in the EU the aim is now for minus 55% of net emissions by 2030. All of this is, of course, as always, in relation to 1990, um, which has now also made the French government plans completely outdated because their aim was minus 40% for 2030. They have to do this now, which is, of course, why your program for the next couple of years is so, so important. Um, just some very quick things because we don't have that much time. But um, potential for regulation and coordination on an EU level is really large. Like the industry standards, just the, the European energy sector, if you really get an energy sector coupling between the different sectors of industry and so on, and also between the countries, you have potentials for efficiency. And although this is not key, like of course the common agricultural policy is quite important for EU. Um, yeah. Nonetheless, with the recent adjustment from the COP26, we are still at an insufficient le level of action in the EU, and not only that, while our domestic EU target is here, which would be almost sufficient, we're kind of aiming for below, oh this is from the cl um, uh, climate action tracker, um, uh, our domestic target would be almost sufficient, domestically we would be probably below two degrees with that target if our pack policies actually come to that target, which they're hopefully going to over the next years, but especially looking at a fair share of, of emissions and looking at the insufficiency of climate finance, there's still quite a long way to go for Europe. Um, so now we're, we're coming to our conclusions and uh, some more, more questions for you. Um, so the first main question is really, are we acting fast enough? And Although this, this plan is really a plan in the right direction, and I really hope all the best that this plan gets implemented by the French next government, we are seeing a massive difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. And as we heard also at the beginning of the week, every tenth of a degree matters. 1.5 is sadly very unlikely that we get there, but every tenth of a degree matters. Um, yeah, as we don't have much time, I'm just going to go on. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, then just one of the, the, the sentences in, in your report. Uh, the Negawatt scenario is not utopian, does not require radical technological, economic or social breakthroughs. Of course, this is quite um, attractive to a lot of policy makers when you're saying them, telling them you don't really have to change much here, just change a couple of levers here and there. But I'm wondering... To what extent is that really reflecting the, the scale of what Negawatt is asking and the scale and urgency of the crisis we are facing? So, just for instance, um, the reduction of meat consumption by 50% is that, I mean, you could argue about these things. I would also say that is not a radical uh, <laughs> change, but I guess a lot of people in France and in this room would argue differently. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just looking at the, the urgency and the, the scale of our ecological crisis, not just e like climate, but also biodiversity and so on, and the needed changes. And the fact, as we heard on Monday from Jean-Baptiste Fressos, that um, energy transitions have never really happened. It's always been the energy transition uh, addition, which you can also kind of see in the picture for energy by source for France. Do we not really need a more radical social ecological transformation, which on the one hand encompasses really a move away from growth while we're just trying to protect what we have. We need to protect what we have, not try to grow. And secondly, well, really focus on decarbonization as soon as possible. And now we're going to come to the more, oh, more, the <laughs> <laughs> more practical questions. They're, they're all on here, so it's not, it's not much more. Um, just quickly on the efficiency aims. Uh, how attainable are they? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you already mentioned this to some extent, the, the energy production, transmission and storage, because I didn't see 
all the other policies in your report always have the sufficiency and efficiency, and I didn't see as much on that in the report, so I was just wondering whether you could elaborate on that a bit for energy production, transmission, storage. Um, then quickly on considering the, the high cost of nuclear power, uh, the, the, <laughs> the risk, obviously, the long construction time for any new power plants. Um, it is kind of a wonder that France and especially F, as the company is, well, it's state-owned, but that's exactly the question, that they are committed to it. And is that state ownership, is it a chance? Because we could, or France could democratically decide we're getting out of this. Or is it perhaps a hindrance because all that risk and that the costs there are kind of, can be put under the carpet because, for instance, in Germany, no electricity company ever wants to invest in nuclear again. It is no profitable investment. So is that that? And then you also talked demo about democracy. What do you think about energy democracy? And now I'll give uh, back to you. Uh, and the last question would be about uh, bioenergy. Uh, so other forms of bioenergy apart from palm, palm oil are now considered by the EU a carbon neutral renewable energy source. Uh, and um, there is a major, major reliance on it in the Negovat scenario. So. Our question would be how will you manage not to use any more land while creating so, so much bioenergy? And if that is not attainable, what will come in to fill in this gap? And if that would be renewables, then why don't we focus on renewables in the first place? And that is the last question. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm. Uh impressed and, uh, and 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 your your questions are challenging so uh, no 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 it's uh, on the contrary on the contrary I'm, I'm very pleased with it um, I'm just I'm just thinking of uh, what to start with um, well maybe I should start with the bioenergy issue as such um, because I mean that I mean I would call I would call it misunderstanding, but uh, it's also because I didn't get into details of the uh, uh, bioenergy part of the uh, scenario. But as you've seen, I, I didn't get into much details of any of the parts, and it already took me one hour. So <laughs> um, the uh, I mean <coughs> um, I mentioned that we go for solid biomass and biogas, and not for biofuels. And one of the reasons is precisely not to use land for dedicated bioenergy. Um, all the bioenergy that is used in the scenario is co-product or byproduct of uh, uh, forestry or agriculture that is firstly meant for food or materials used. Um, and <coughs> I mean the uh, the uh, I mean the, the the scenario is meeting uh, the so-called um, uh, zero net artifici artificialization, uh, whatever is, it means. But so they, they, I mean there, there's no uh, f no further uh, land uh, that is uh, artificialized. Um, and yeah, that is uh, mostly, uh, well, the Negawatt scenario is coupled with a scenario that's called AFTER, you could look at it if you're interested, which is developed by uh, an, um, uh, an NGO think tank called Solagro, which really develops the same kind of approach for forestry and agriculture as we do for energy. Um, and <coughs> I mean, we, uh, for instance, we uh, make sure in the scenario that we stop, of course, any uh, bioenergy import. We make sure that we increase France's capacity to export food, especially uh, to uh, the uh, other side of uh, Mediterranean, where uh, we can grow as much as we can. So we 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 make sure that the uh, that the uh, i mean the, the, the high potential for uh, agriculture of france is used for the most needed uh, uses food first and materials um, which is yeah why we uh, are uh, 
uh, confident that the kind of development of biomass for energy that we uh, include in the scenario is consistent with land use concerns and uh, is not um, uh, is not uh, uh, set in uh, how how do you say in in in, in a kind of extractive uh, ideology. I mean, it, it's really the other way around. I mean, we we, we might be wrong in our uh, numbers, but uh, the uh, objective is really the opposite. Um, and <coughs> also regarding health effects, uh, you are right that burning wood can uh, uh, can uh, <coughs> uh, mean uh, higher uh, air pollution. Um, the uh, wood that is burned in the scenario is only burned in uh, in um, central stations, uh, in uh, urban heating systems, or in uh, modern wood systems in houses, uh, meaning that uh, it's, I mean, the uh, pollution is filtered, uh, of course. Otherwise, uh, yes, you create a, a, a huge uh, pollution issue. The scenario altogether, I mean, we, we we do not have a complete assessment of its impact on air pollution, but we looked for the impact, especially in dense areas, of uh, different uh, factors. Uh, air pollution from, uh, from road traffic, air pollution from uh, combustion, and uh, the uh, overall uh, balance is a kind of twofold reduction of uh, um, uh, 10 micron, I think, uh, particles, I'm not really sure. Uh, but the, a two-fold reduction of air pollution in those uh, kind of uh, most sensitive uh, areas. Um, <coughs> the reason why we think uh, developing the use of biomass is needed is that um, it is one of the leverages we have. And uh, not using it puts even more pressure on the other leverages. I mean, the leverages are leverages on the overall level of demand, sufficiency and efficiency, and substitution either by electric sources or by biomass. And if you don't use biomass, that means you have a lot of combustion-based uh, energy consumption to substitute with electric-based energy consumption. That puts a lot of pressure on the need for changing equipments, the materials, the, uh, the uh, electric grid, and the costs, and the speed you can achieve. I've read some, uh, some uh, scenarios for Germany, for instance, which consider that uh, all mobility could be uh, electricity-based by 2030. I mean, if you look at numbers, about the uh, vehicles that you need to change, the number of, uh, of uh, charging points that you need to implement and that's all, that's not possible. Or electrifying 100% industry by 2030, that's not possible. So the more you raise the ambition from a climate perspective, and I agree that we need to do so, and the, uh, uh, the uh, French, uh, the, the Negawatt scenario for France is um, meeting the uh, fit, for fit for 55 uh, uh, objective, which means roughly 50% for France and not 55% because of the uh, of where we start from. Uh, but we, um, I mean, we, we meet that objective, and uh, the accumulated emissions throughout the scenario are consistent with the French share of the overall emissions burden to meet 1.5 degrees objective by the end of the century, which leaves completely open the issue of uh, what happens in the second half. How do you, ge how do you get to, uh, uh, to uh, negative emissions, uh, either only th with uh, natural sinks, but we are kind of, I mean, our, our scenario is based on um, kind of regenerating those natural sinks on the French territory uh, in the next decades due to changes in forestry and change in agriculture modes that allow for more bioenergy without 
uh, without um, tensions on, on land use. But that means you don't get those, uh, those uh, sinks anymore uh, for the, uh, because you're, you, you've resaturated them by 2050. And I mean, the, the, the issue of negative emissions without technological uh, sinks is uh, really uh, difficult. And I mean, we, we don't have an answer to that, but at least our cumulative emissions by 2050 are fit with the French share of a 1.5 degrees trajectory. Uh, but if you want to uh, be on that track um, and, and, and you put all the pressure on electric renewables, the electric grid and shifting to electric equipments and infrastructures, I mean, that is more difficult to achieve by uh, to achieve fast than doing so, but also uh, developing uh, developing um, uh, biomass use. Uh, at least, I mean, it, 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 it is really our analysis of the uh, optimum combination of leverages that we could think of, taking into account all uh, sustainable goals objectives. Um, then, I mean, you raise the issue of the uh, of the overall ambition and the uh, and, and the uh, I mean, whether uh, whether the, the, this kind of scenario is achievable. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I see two um, I mean two, two, two points to comments to to make um, uh, to try to answer that uh, concern. Um, the first one is about I mean, the uh, issue of realism versus ambition. And uh, I mean, that, that is really difficult. I, mean, we, I, uh, I said uh, earlier that um, we have uh, different partners in our European scenario project uh, of different nature. That means that we have uh, partners that are NGOs involved in, um, in the Climate Action Network Europe, for instance, uh, which, which call for uh, always uh, further uh, ambition. We also have more government-related institutes, like in Lithuania or Hungary, for instance, which, uh, which are uh, happy to think out of the uh, government box uh, in that project, but are culturally not ready to go for the same level of ambition, they start from more, uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, traditional uh, visions. Um, and we agreed in the beginning um, to, uh, I mean, to a common objective of for our European uh, scenario of meeting carbon neutrality by 2050 at the latest. Um, no, meeting carbon neutrality at the earliest and by 2050 at the latest and meeting 100% renewables the same. Um, and some of our, our NGO partners, because of the Fit for 55 movement, because the, the CAN Europe, for instance, CAN Europe is uh, now advocating for uh, carbon neutrality by 2040. I mean, they are calling for our common objective to, 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 to shift to, to this. And uh, I mean, it, it's very difficult, it's very challenging. We had a, a, a discussion uh, uh, last month uh, with our partners, and uh, I mean, you, you might know him, Vendel Trio. Is, 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 uh, he was, until uh, about one year ago, the head of, uh, of uh, Can Europe. Um, and we, we discussed this. I mean, uh, and it, it, it is really a matter of two kind of realism, a, a combination between the realism that we need to have regarding the objectives, because climate agency calls for it, and the realism that we need to have when it comes to uh, a, a practical and, and, and possible pathway. And this is really, remember I, I, I talked about a crest line in the beginning. This is really what we are trying to, um, to, 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 to set with our scenario. 
which is also why it's important to start with the current situation. I mean, we, we, we don't start with a long-term objective and do like, you know, retro planning, uh, backcasting scenario. We start with the current situation and push the levers as much as we can, uh, taking into account inertia. And uh, <coughs> you uh, questioned uh, the, 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 whether our uh, ambitious efficiency objectives are attainable, for instance. Uh, well, we've been working, we'd, we've been advocating for and working on uh, deep thermal retrofitting of buildings for a long time. I mean, Negawatt was one of the, uh, uh, of the players which uh, pushed for this objective to be introduced as early as 2007 during the uh, Grenelle uh, process. Um, but, I mean, we, we, we just witnessed that there's not much progress in terms of uh, actual uh, uh, program. We've developed uh, practical tools that are available that, that deliver, uh, whether it's on uh, uh, preparing for, uh, for um, uh, I mean, for, for professionals to retrofit or for uh, whether it's about financing schemes. We know it is possible. It's then a matter of political will willingness. And uh, this leads me to uh, maybe my uh, final point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully, uh, which is the uh, energy and democracy issue. Um, I mean, I started with the, uh, the, 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 the fact that we witness a lack of political feasibility within current institutions. They are democratic, but they are very much vertical. Uh, they, 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 they can't provide, especially in France, with, where they are heavily uh, centralized, they can't provide the kind of transformative policies that we need. Um, and I mean, whether the objectives, whether the ambition we, we set is attainable depends on that. Not, not on the practical feasibility on the ground. We have evidence that it can be done. And uh, I mean, the, the, we are cautious. Uh, I, I told you about figures about, about the number of windmills, for instance. Um, I mean, it's because we are cautious on the potential for scaling up that we have figures that you consider to be low compared to ambition in Germany. We, start, we, we don't start from the same uh, point. We don't have the same potential, politically speaking. We take this into account. Uh, but, um, I mean, yeah, it's a matter of political feasibility. When you look at the climate, um, citizens, how do you say in English? Citizens Convention for Climate? Convention Citoyenne Climat, I mean, which, which was said by, uh, by uh, the president, who promised he would take unfiltered uh, its uh, recommendations. And then it, when the convention provided uh, its conclusion, I mean, it, it, it was not even a filter. It was a wall of denial of uh, the uh, relevance of what these citizens have said. Because this uh, citizens' convention just illustrated how citizens, when they are put in the right conditions of deliberating about these issues, just come to the right conclusions and come to the uh, proper proposals. So it's, it's up to uh, policymakers to accept that people could be ready for setting the kind of policies that make the kind of ambition we set attainable. That's all I can say, and the, I mean, the, 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 the kind of cautious way we take, I mean, not, I mean, trying not to be too radical, I mean, pushing radicality just to the limit of what could be, could still be uh, uh, paid attention to by policymakers, um, I mean, it's not enough. I mean, we need other players that are more radical, but I mean, in, in this role, I think we've been uh, very useful. 
I mean, um, the, uh, uh, just as an example, France Info today on its website has uh, on front page an article about sufficiency, where I'm uh, largely uh, quoted. And I mean, it, it's thanks to years of advocating work that we get to such article which says, how come uh, presidential candidates don't take this in the debate as a required uh, option? Um, yeah, I, well, I just left uh, out the uh, question about EDF. I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure the, uh, the, the, the right question is whether it's because of its public status that it can't be part of the transition. I think this has more to deal with, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, uh, what we inherit from the past, I mean, uh, in the 70s, there was a kind of political consensus to make EDF as a national monopolistic uh, company uh, the, the uh, tool for maintaining the uh, public service in the uh, kind of heavy sense that, uh, uh, that France uh, was attached to, at least at that time. And to decide that the nuclear program was the way to guarantee this role of EDF and this public service. And we are, we are stuck with that. I mean, it, it, we can discuss whether it worked or not. I think not, but some people think it worked. But whether, I mean, anyway, it's not working anymore. But policymakers are just stuck with the uh, difficulty to develop a new model and deal with the heavy uh, financial burden of EDF. <laughs>